Hey everyone, welcome to another edition of Power Core Productions and Podcastings. Today, we're going to be doing a two-part movie special for My Hero Academia Armored Adventures. What if Deku was Iron Man? This will be the second movie, Wakanda Forever. Now, as a lot of you know, this is a special that has been cultivated with the My Hero Academia Arm and Adventure series for a while now, as I wanted to do something to flesh out the universe that I'm creating. This is one of the key aspects that's really going to be the main focal point of Phase 3 as a whole, the Fallout Saga. That being of fleshing out each individual story's universe. Because while I love Marvel, I don't want it to be, oh, you become over-reliant on the multiverse gathering heroes together premise. Because you can only do that so many times before, you know, you run the concept into the ground. So with my stories, I don't want it to be, oh, you're just waiting for the next team up. I want you to be excited about the worlds that you're really exploring. So with this movie, I'm hoping to establish more about this universe in particular and to get you guys excited about what's to come as we continue on in the My Hero Academia Iron Man universe. So anyway, without further ado, let's get into today's video. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Our story begins following the battle between All Might, the Mandarin, and All for One. With the assistance of the young heroes, All Might was able to defeat the two villains, bringing an end to the chase of the Makuan Rings. With the rings seemingly being destroyed, there was no need for the guardians that protected them, among them being young T'Challa himself. He said his goodbyes to Izuku and everyone as he would make his way back home to Wakanda. In the short time he had been a transfer student to UA, he got to explore Japan, see some of the sights, help save the world, all in a day's work for the young prince, a prince that was now set to become king. T'Challa would watch as the cove that kept Wakanda invisible to the world dissipated, the veil being lifted as he watched his beautiful city come into view. As his ship landed, he would be greeted by his mother and sister. His mother was happy to see that her son had succeeded in his assignment and that he had come home. It was going to be a special occasion. For you see, T'Challa was now set to become king. His father had passed when he was young, and ever since then his mother had ruled as queen of Wakanda. When T'Challa became of age, he underwent the trial needed to become the Black Panther, never accepting the title of king. Then there was the incident in Japan with the Makuan rings that had to be dealt with, and now that the ring that Wakanda had watched over, now being destroyed and no longer in use, there was nothing tying them to it. It meant that now T'Challa could focus on his next duty, the next part of his life. The day of the ceremony would commence. It was a sacred tradition to have all of the tribes of Wakanda brought together as the young boy stood amongst them all. The petitioner of the ceremony would speak out amongst all of the tribal leaders. Today is the day that Prince T'Challa will ascend to the throne to have the title of King of Wakanda as well as the Black Panther. As is tradition, before he can ascend to the throne, each tribe must be asked, will you send a representative to fight for the title? One by one, each tribe would decline as none saw the need to challenge 
for the throne. All except for one. It was the tribe of the Jabari, the ape tribe, and among them their leader, Mbaku. The ape tribe among the many tribes of Wakanda, they possessed with them a special quirk in and of itself. Yes, my friends, the people of Wakanda also had quirks among many things. It was not lost upon them. Although with their society, quirk users and the usage of them, they all played by different rules. M'Baku, the leader of the Jabari tribe, had the quirk known as Great Gorilla. For this quirk passed down through the tribe, gave the users the strength, the speed, the reflexes, and the senses of the Great Gorilla of Wakanda itself. M'Baku towered over the young man as he looked to the crowd. Are we seriously going to make this young man king? You have played around with the throne long enough, my highness. Shuri simply rolled her eyes at this, looking to her mother. Does he really have to start something today, mother? I mean, it's not like... No, no, Shuri. M'Baku! You wish to challenge for the throne? But of course! It is you who have kept the throne hidden for all this time. With all due respect, when your husband died, it should have been passed to one of us. But no, you have held on to it, waiting for the right time when your son could ascend. This young man, he is strong. But Wakanda needs a leader, a true one. You merely have children who scoff at tradition. But I believe we must set things back to the old ways. The Black Panther, the title of king, its duty is to Wakanda. And yet your son goes gallivanting around the world whenever he wishes. Is that really what we need? Nimbaku towered over the young boy. If you wish to go running with your tail between your legs, then you are free to do so. And you can keep the title of Black Panther. But the title of king, that you are not. I accept your challenge, T'Challa would say to M'Baku. With that, T'Challa would be stripped of the power of the Black Panther. Of course, this would reduce him to being quirkless. But it was the rule. You could only fight with your natural strength. Quirks counted as natural strength. Whether you had it or you didn't, it didn't matter. T'Challa would engage with M'Baku in traditional combat. M'Baku using his strength to tower and to overpower the boy. T'Challa had to be quick and on his feet. If he had learned and gained anything in his lifetime... It was learning to make do with what you were given. T'Challa embodied this to the full. Even without a quirk, his father always taught him, even in the short time that they had spent together, how to be a good fighter, a quick tactician, to always be able to find a way, even when it seemed like there was none. T'Challa was able to overcome eventually managing to get to a blind spot of M'Baku, striking him in the back of the leg and rendering him down to a knee, before grabbing his staff and burying it close to his neck, putting him in a chokehold and fighting desperately to keep him there. M'Baku tried slamming him onto the ground over and over, but the boy's iron will would not be broken. 
he would not let go of the hold, and M'Baku slowly started to lose breath. He slammed himself back down one more time. T'Challa broke a rib, but still he fought with the courage of a hundred panthers, not letting go. Give up M'Baku, or it will be the end of both of us. No, I will not. You have fought valiantly, but your people need you. Tell me, are you really that arrogant that you would sacrifice yourself meaninglessly? M'Baku used all of his strength to break free of T'Challa's hold, kicking the boy down once again as he caught his breath once more. <laughs> you fight valiantly for a boy with no power, but you will take more than your tricks to stop. T'Challa would take a page from those whom he had learned. It was always good to let someone go on a soliloquy because it gave you just enough time to figure out your next plan. For T'Challa, that plan involved a sucker punch to the nose, hitting square in the center of the face, stunning M'Baku just long enough, T'Challa grabbing some rope on the ground. He would tie up his legs and force him down once again. Before M'Baku even had a chance to get up, T'Challa, with all of his strength, took hold of his knife, burying it into M'Baku's hand, stabbing it into the ground and keeping him there. M'Baku yelled out in pain before he would be stabbed once again in the abdomen. Thankfully, T'Challa knew where to stab a man so as not to kill him. But to wound him enough just to get the advantage, he would do so. <sighs> Yield! Yield! I yield! I yield! T'Challa would immediately fall to the ground calling for medical aids for both him and M'Baku. M'Baku would be treated with the best care that Wakanda had to offer, and he would make a full recovery. Although deep down, he held no ill will to the boy. After all, he had to see if the boy had his father's spirit. And he passed. It was a painful lesson, but he passed. With that, T'Challa would be restored to the throne and the power of the Black Panther would be given to him through the means of the heart-shaped herb. With that, T'Challa would now become king, a young king in his own right. As he was going to have the first council meeting, he would stop by Shuri's lab to see what she was working on. But for Shuri... The only thing she wanted to know about was Japan more than anything else. I barely got to see anything while I was there, brother. The only thing I could do was go and pick you up and visit some ramen shops. But still, what was it like? Tell me. <laughs> Japan is another beast in and of itself. I met a lot of interesting people there. What about that boy, Izuka Midoriya? The Iron Man. He definitely lives up to his reputation. He is an Iron Man indeed. And a good friend. Do you think I'll ever get to meet him? I'd love to be able to go over some of his work. I mean, the Iron Man suit, it's a nice piece of technology. Of course, it could use some upgrades. And what upgrades would you make to it? Well, I mean, given the metal that he uses, I think vibranium would be a much better substitute. It's lighter, faster, quieter, more efficient. 
Huh. Maybe I'll have one made for myself then. <laughs> oh, please. I give him praise. But I would put up my work against his any day of the week, brother. And since you are the king now, I have to make sure that you are up to snuff. Anyway, you better hurry or you're going to be late for your meeting. <laughs> sure thing. T'Challa would make his way to the throne room. As he sat on the great throne that many kings and queens had sat upon before him. His mother sitting to his side. He met with the council to discuss any reports or situations that required his attention. Among them all, there was the dealing with the black arms dealer known as Ulysses Claw. Claw had been one of Wakanda's biggest problems, especially in the last 25 years. Constantly sneaking in and out of Wakanda, stealing vibranium. Not just here, but all around the world, whenever he could get his hands on it. Many had died at his hands as a result. If there was anyone who was at the top of the wanted list, it was him. We have reason to believe that Claw is going to be in the United States. It's said that there is going to be a gala a black market dealing and it's going to be there where the vibranium will be sold this could be our chance to bring claw in once and for all and then there's also the matters of what happened near the Atlantic Ocean it's this this here vessel it is believed that the scientists on board were trying to drill for vibranium at the bottom of the sea. That is perplexing, T'Challa would say. Is that even possible? I thought that all of vibranium, it was only in Wakanda. That is the original belief, my liege. But there are those who say that vibranium could potentially be found in other places in the world. Okoye, one of the guards of the Dora Milaje, would be the first one irate at hearing this. But that can't be possible. If vibranium was found anywhere else but in Wakanda, it would change everything that we've ever believed in. I mean, the world's already advanced so much in the last 200 years especially since these quirks became a thing. And even more so, if others are able to get their hands on vibranium, who knows what this can mean for the world? Now, now, there is no need to panic. These are merely rumors. But why is this vessel of any importance? Because the entire crew was slaughtered. But it wasn't by us. No, I don't know if these scientists were on the right track, one of the advisors would say. But if they were truly drilling and trying to find vibranium, and even more so, if another group felt that they were actually close enough that they decided to kill them and it wasn't our own, then who knows what we're dealing with. It could be a lot more deeper than any of us originally thought. But for now, we will have to focus primarily on Claw. You say he's going to be in the United States? Los Angeles, to be specific. California. How would you like to proceed? I am going to go and bring Claw in myself. He is honestly what my father would have called his greatest failure. And it is time that he be brought to justice. One of T'Challa's closest friends, a young warrior by the name of Wakabe, would ask to join him. He had lost his father when he was young as well, due to one of Claw's attacks. Together, they could take him down side by side. However, T'Challa would say that he was best suited to be here. He was going to be going with the Koi. The less 
that went the better. Even if he had diplomatic immunity, it was still unwise to go treading in the territory without permission. The smaller the group, the better. However, before leaving, he did want to make a call. Hello? Izuku Midoriya. T'Challa, how are you? I'm doing well, my friend. And I hope you are also. Yeah, I'm good. Oh, what's up? I'd like to ask if you'd be free for a little while. I'm going on a bit of an exploit in Los Angeles. The United States? Yes. There's someone there that I need to bring in. I was wondering if maybe I could get your assistance on it. I'd love to help, but I'm kind of caught up in something right now. I'm actually getting ready to go on, I guess you could say, an assignment. A rescue. A rescue. That is important. But what if I sent someone in my place? Someone that could help? Any help you send would be much appreciated, my friend. Good. I know just the guy. So let me get this straight, Bakugo said, rubbing his eyes. You want me to go in as War Machine and help T'Challa bring in some criminal in the United States? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you just got your pro heroes license. I can make a cover for you. It's not going to take too long. He just needs a little help to make sure that everything goes all right. It'll be in and out, no problem. <sighs> Bakugo kind of wanted to go. Oh, who is he kidding? Flying in the war machine suit was awesome. Of course he wanted to go. He just didn't want to show Izuku how excited he was. So how exactly am I going to get there? I got a private jet. Suit's already loaded and everything. I've got a couple of arc reactors already stored in there for you. Ready to go to charge up the suits. They're pretty long lasting. At least this batch is. But still, whenever one's getting ready to be done with... Just incinerate it and dispose of it. I don't need it falling into the wrong hands. Yeah, yeah, nothing to worry about. Oh, also, you'll need this. Izuku would hand him a heavy textbook. What the hell? It's an instruction manual. I've had to make a lot of upgrades to the suit, especially to incorporate and work with your quirk. It stores a lot more of your sweat. And you can fire off to be a lot more powerful blast and other sorts of weapons. You're going to need to know how all of this functions. Also, if you need any assistance, I have an AI ready on standby. His name's Jarvis. You named him Jarvis? After, yeah. I figure it's the best way to remember him by. He was always a big help and I don't want him to fade away. I mean, the AI itself isn't actually Jarvis, but I like to think it's nice to hear his voice. Hello, Mr. Kotsky Bakugo, Jarvis would say. I will be assisting you in your mission. Please to make your acquaintance. Uh, yeah. So, when do I leave? In the next 48 hours. So you'll have to pack up whatever you need and get ready to fly out. <sighs> All right, let's go. Bakugo would be seen off as he flew into the air, making his way to the United States itself. Thankfully, he had been brushing up on his English. He was going to need to. Now, shall we go over chapter one, sir? I'm going to sleep. Good. But I will have to wake you up at the proper time to make sure that you eat. And also to go over more about the manual. Yeah, yeah, it's nothing to worry about. Eesh. Eventually, they would land in the private hangar. Izuku had already made the arrangements. As Bakugo would set off from the jet, he would be greeted by Okoye and T'Challa. So, this is the UA student you talked about. I see. He does look like a Pikachu. And what's that supposed to mean? 
Spiky yellow hair, Okoye would say. It's cute. Hmm. It's good that you were able to come, Bakugo. It's nice to make your acquaintance again. And under better circumstances. Yeah, yeah. So who's the target we're taking in? His name is Ulysses Claw. He is a black market arms dealer. He's stolen vibranium from Wakanda. He's been on our most wanted list for a while now. We just need to make sure that we bring him in and that there's no extracurriculars, if you know what I mean. Okay, so is it just us? Yes, you, me, Okoye, and me. What was that? The group turned and looked at the car. They heard something rattling in the trunk. T'Challa couldn't believe it. No, 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 no. I know she did. Shuri! Hi, brother. Oh, my God. <sighs> Shuri, why are you here? Does mom know? I mean... What she doesn't know won't hurt. Shuri! Oh my god! No. You know what? No. You, Okoye, take her on the plane and take her back to... I cannot leave you, master. But you can't sit... I... You... You... Shuri! This can't be happening. This can't be... You're going to need my help, brother. Don't act like you won't. I am the one who has modifications to your suit. And you'll need my intellect. All of you will. I mean, come on. What are you going to expect from this one over here? Bakugo would only growl at her, but still, Shuri wasn't deterred at all. You're not Izuku Midoriya. So what, are you a substitute for the Iron Man? I ain't nobody's substitute. I'm the war machine, Bakugo. Ah, Katsuki Bakugo! I read your profile. I love the way that you use your sweaty nitroglycerin to create explosions. Like, you just yell and you go so hardcore when you're like, boom, boom, die, die, murder, murder, explosion, explosion. It's amazing! Not, no, T'Challa would say. It looked like it was going to have to be the four of them. He was just going to have to make adjustments to the plan. That's all. Just some adjustments. Nothing could go wrong. Everything, it, it would all work out. It would all work out. All he has to do is make sure that everyone goes back home. What's the worst that could happen? The night of the black market Met Gala was set to take place. It was going to be at a casino. Now, normally, underage children wouldn't be welcomed, but we're talking about villains, super criminals, and those who don't have the best of intentions. All that mattered is that you had money and that you were there with a purpose. As long as that was the case, you didn't have anything to worry about. We're going to go in pose as villains. We're just going to lay low. The second Claw steps out into the open, we take him down, grab the vibranium, and we drag him back to the base. Okay, and what exactly am I supposed to do? You will be on standby, Bakugo, with the war machine armor. If anyone tries to get involved, you shield. Also, I shouldn't have to explain this to you, but you'd be wise not to kill anyone while you're over here. You know, other country, things of that nature. Yeah, yeah, I got it. Cover your backs, make sure no one gets in the way, you track down your criminal, you bring them back in, bing, bang, boom, we all go home. Yes, that is all we have to do. Shuri, you stay in the hotel. And by no means do you leave it. Understood. I'll be on comms. With that, everyone had their assignments. 
They knew what they needed to do. T'Challa and the Koye would make their way to the banquet hall. Bakugo would be stationed nearby in the war machine armor, just waiting in the wings. Shuri would be at the hotel on the computer, patching everyone's comms and making sure everything ran accordingly. Of course, her mother was definitely going to chew her out a new one when they got back home, but still, she was a patient woman. They have each other. They have each other. T'Challa will take care of Shuri. Shuri will take care of T'Challa. They will come back home. I am going to ground her to the dust. But as long as they are safe, that is all that matters. T'Challa and the others would all have to hope that nothing threw a wrench in their plans. Inside of the Met Gala for the super criminals, you definitely would find the lowest of the low all in one area. T'Challa along with the Koye, they made a few purchases. Small, nothing too fancy. We could definitely get some decent tech around here, to say the least. If it wasn't so illegal, he might even have to consider shopping here for a spell. Stay focused. We don't want to draw too much attention to ourselves. They waited in the wings, drinking, non-alcoholic of course, and watching from the shadows, waiting as they saw Ulysses' claw along with his entourage going into a private room with another individual. <laughs> so nice to meet you, Mr. Ross. Yeah, yeah, enough with the small talk. Do you actually have what I've come for, or is this just a one waste of time? No, no, my friend, no need to be so hasty. You know, it cost me an arm and a leg to get all of this stuff. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. Personally, between you and me, I have to deal with a lot of savages in this business. He even had to lose an arm. Could you believe that? Claw would open the briefcase, showing the vibranium. This is state of the line. So, what will your top price be? I'm working with individuals who are looking to pay good money for that. I'd say we can easily start at around 1.2 billion. Ooh, you know how to do business, my friend. Maybe we can bump it up to a 4.1, 3.5, 3.7. That works for me. The money would be handed over to Claw. And just as he was preparing to hand over the vibranium, T'Challa and Okoye were ready to make their move when a couple of guards spotted them. They had been keeping an eye on the two for a while now. They hadn't really done much since they had been here, but more importantly, it looked like they were about to start something. Seeing that the cover was blown, the two of them would have no choice but to fight. Claw reaching for the vibranium and the money, would knock over Mr. Ross before attempting to escape along with his entourage. T'Challa would immediately make a move for Claw while Okoye would make cover, the two of them hopping outside and joining into a high-speed chase along the roadside. Bakugo, seeing what was going down, would fly his armor into the skies above and fly overhead. Shuri watching on from the computer itself as the chase would begin. Do you have eyes on the target? T'Challa would say. Yeah, he's heading for the bridge up ahead. There's no traffic, so we have a good way of cutting him off at the pass. Three more cars would be following behind Okoye and T'Challa, shooting at them. I'll take care of the losers. You go after the main target. Okoye and T'Challa would nod as they drove ahead after Claw, Bakugo staying back on the road, stopping the three other cars as they began to open up, 
various would-be criminals with guns and quirks all alike. Okay, let's dance. Shuri would be like a kid in a candy store, watching all of the thrilling action and everything that was going down. Bakugo going through a horde of criminals with ease, Okoye continuing in the high-speed chase, T'Challa morphing into the Black Panther suit that she had made just for him, capable of storing and keeping kinetic energy. As he was able to jump to the car that Claw was driving on, he would use a discharge of the energy itself to destroy it in one fell swoop. In the midst of the chaos, Claw would use a specially made arm, turning it into a sonic cannon, attempting to fire at the Black Panther. <laughs> a new one. Interesting. So who are you? King or Prince? It doesn't matter, murderer. I am the one who is going to bring you to justice. <laughs> You're nothing more but a savage. A savage about to be pulled out of his misery. T'Challa would make short work of Claw, preparing to deal a death blow. However, there were those standing by watching, some starting to record. Claw would take advantage. Mercy, King! Mercy! Wait! A couple of police cars would arrive not too long after. T'Challa wasn't in the mood. He raised his arm ready to bring it down. When something stopped him, he would be struck by lightning, followed by a red, white, and blue shield-like construct made of energy being hurled in his direction. A little bit of a late night to be causing all this fuss, don't you think? And who in the hell are you? Bakugo would catch up to T'Challa, the two of them standing against the other two that were waiting. Name's James. James Rogers. And I am Toran. What business do you have here? This is none of your concern. <laughs> I don't think you understand, my friend, James would say. You come over here, my neck of the woods causing trouble? It is my business. James Rogers, a.k.a. hero name, Captain America. His quirk, peak human. The quirk peak human allows for a person who was born to be born in peak physical condition, meaning that they don't have to exercise or do anything of the like. You are born as a superhuman. In the grand scheme of things, many would say that in this day and age, a quirk of this magnitude is honestly overrated, but they would be quite wrong. Because in this universe, what you would acquire to be the super soldier serum used in the Captain America lore has actually now been converted into that of a quirk, being born in the peak human condition. Also, in this universe, James is actually a 7th generation Rogers. Who was 1st generation, you might ask? Well, it was none other than Steve Rogers, aka the first Captain America. Although, in this world, the lore is a lot different than most. You could say that technically he was one of the oldest quirk users, but it's been a lot more modified and details we'll go into later. But for now, this is the seventh generation Rogers, known as James Rogers. Along with James would be Torin, a UK exchange student, also fellow classmate and hero mate, or as her hero name, Thunderstrike. Her quirk, electrokinesis, the ability to manipulate, shape, and generate electricity. Doing so, she is able to do things like fly via electromagnetism and could control natural lightning and electricity and could even make storm or thunder clouds whenever the condition is right. She, along with James, attend the school known as National Hero Academy, which you could say is basically the United States equivalent to UA from Japan. 
with these being the American hero students. They had just so happened to be on a night patrol, since the both of them had their hero licenses as well, when they heard all of the commotion going on. And by the time they arrive, they find two strange individuals, one looking like he's about to bury panther claws into one's chest, so it was only natural that they would try to break things up. For the last time, T'Challa would say to James, this is none of your concern. It looked like the two sides were gearing up for a fight. However, another car would pull up with an older man walking out. His name, Everett Ross, agent of the CIA. He would tell everyone to stand down and that he was going to be taking over things from here. Claw would be brought into custody in the US and everyone here was being rounded up. Shuri would arrive to the precinct where everyone was to make sure that her brother was safe among everything else. For Ross, this was supposed to be a sting operation. It was supposed to be so simple. Bring in a known arms dealer, get dangerous weapons and other stolen goods off the street, yada yada yada. But now he found himself dealing with foreign affairs, all these other policies, people from seemingly all over except for where they were supposed to be. A foreign exchange student from the UK, a UA student from Japan, people from the country of Wakanda of all places, the new king of all things. Oh, he needed smokes or coffee, maybe both, who knows. But for now, he had an interrogation to do. Mr. Ulysses Claw, Ross would say. Can I get you anything? Water, coffee, cigarettes, something to eat, a burger maybe? You and I have a lot to talk about. <laughs> It seems you have your hands full. What? You're running a preschool around here? Or you have children doing a man's job? <sighs> you don't need to worry about that. For now, you have a lot more bigger issues to deal with. Besides facing what could be multiple life sentences, for one. <laughs> you don't know the half of it, my friend. What I'm dealing with, and what you're dealing with, we live in two completely different worlds, brother. And what do you mean by that? <laughs> what I deal in is not in weapons, but in rare metals and things of that nature. Yeah, so what about this little caper that you pulled in the UK? Entered into a museum, murdered everyone inside, this had nothing to do with you, huh? <laughs> Just trying to get my hands on some vibranium, my friend. One of the most powerful and expensive metals in the world. And that boy, dressed like a cat, he's the king of it all. What, you're talking about Wakanda? It's a third world country. They specialize in sheep and textiles. <laughs> That's what they want you to think. They're just pulling the wool over your head, mate. They can probably see me, right? Hi. He really grows on you, Bakugo would say. So, let me try to get this straight, James would ask. Why the hell is a student from UA here, of all places? I brought him here for assistance, T'Challa would say. You guys just don't seem to care about the rules. Great, we're dealing with a bunch of lawbreakers of all things. Hey, I got my hero license just like you. Yeah, but I'm pretty sure your hero license only works in Japan. They're not international. Wait, they're not? Of course they're not, James would ask, throw out. What, the, what made you think that they were international? I mean, you can get an international license, but that requires three years of schooling at some of the more pristine academies in the world. And honestly, I'm not really trying to see how you got into UA in the first place. I mean, what? 
you sweat explosions. It's kind of gross. Bakugo just raised his hand and threw an explosion at James, knocking him across the room. All right, you want to go? Well, let's go then. Trust me, you don't want that. No, I think I do. James would throw one of his energy projection shields at Bakugo, knocking him over as the both of them were ready for a fight. Torin and Shuri would try to calm them down as Ross would have to get their, all of their attention. Okay, King, you and I need to talk. Apparently, your country has a lot of this vibranium stuff, apparently. <laughs> it's nothing to concern yourself with, Mr. Ross. All you need to know is that the man in your possession has broken many laws in my country, and I am simply looking to bring him to justice. So if you could please hand him over. I don't think I'm going to be doing such a thing. Not until I get all of the details first, my friend. The details, you don't need to worry yourself with them. No, I think I do. Because up until now, we haven't really been keeping any tabs on Wakanda. But if just a portion of what he's saying is true, then it's obvious that you guys have a lot more than what you're letting on then. As they continued in their conversation, Claw, he simply waited. Because he knew that his associates were going to be coming for him in about five, four, three, two, and one. An explosion would occur inside of the precinct. Multiple armed men moving in to where Ulysses' claw was being held, freeing him from his restraints, and now breaking him out. T'Challa and Bakugo would suit up instantly, Bakugo hopping into the war machine suit, heading outside directly, only to catch a blue fist directly to his face. Managing to actually crack the suit somewhat. Damn it! What the hell is that? A massive being that towered over him would pick him up before slamming him back to the ground. As Bakugo had to go into overdrive just to be able to match this thing blow for blow while T'Challa was trying to get back at Claw. James would also come in trying to make the assist only to be stopped as someone else would get in his way. A man dressed in black with what appeared to be a skull emblem as his face symbol. Just as he said, a bunch of children. <clears throat> I'm not done yet. James hopped back to his feet, shield at the ready. <laughs> Isn't that cute? Cosplaying as Captain America, huh? Wait. Don't tell me. You're related to him? Yeah. And what of it? <laughs> so much they talk in school about your grandpa or your great 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 grandpa, so to speak. A pioneer in American heroism. All they go is spouting off all that bullshit. Well, let's see. How much fight you got in you, kid? Let's find out. James would engage one-on-one -on -one with the master assailant, known as Crossbones. Oh, come on. Surely you can do better than that. Crossbones would kneel him in the gut delivering a few more punches to the face as he kicked them back. James would throw one of his energy projection shields, only for crossbones to catch it and break it. <laughs> and they call you peak human, huh? Well, if this is what you and your grandpa are capable of, no wonder why you're a generation of losers. As crossbones continued to beat down on James, Torin would come in with a strike of lightning, her sword drawn and ready to fight. Ooh, 
pretty one. <laughs> Maybe you can put up more of a fight than your boyfriend did. He's not my boyfriend. What's the matter, kid? Lovers quarrel. Don't worry. I'll make sure you two have plenty of time to reconnect in the afterlife. Torrin would engage with Crossbones, managing to put up a decent fight against the assassin and hired gun. As they continued on in their fight, James would try to jump in once more, only to be knocked back down. Torn would try to cover him as Crossbones was looking to crush his head in with a cinder block. But it was all just a diversion. Torn let her guard down and he was easily able to take the sword out of her hand. But it wasn't the sword that made her powerful. It was her own strength and her quirk. But unfortunately for these kids, as they would soon realize, they were going up against beings high above their pay grade. Bakugo, in the meanwhile, found himself in a perplexing situation, to say the least, fighting against blue-skinned individuals that towered over him tremendously. Because who in the hell were they? Bakugo, in the meantime, while he was fending off against these strange assailants, T'Challa was chasing after Claw as he escaped there was someone in a tribal mask who fired off a powerful sonic cannon, knocking him down just long enough for them to escape. Bones would get the message as well. He quickly used the sword, bypassing Torrin's defense, stabbing her in the gut and leaving her there. James would rush desperately to her side, he created as big of a shield as he could and tried to slam it into his back, only for him to be knocked down as well. <laughs> Heads up. Crossbones threw a grenade at the two of them, exiting the room as it exploded. Everett couldn't make heads or tails of what was going on. Shuri, in the meantime, was worried about her brother. Okoye was helping Bakugo as they battled against the blue-skinned individuals. The situation only became more dire when they turned their attention from Okoye and from Bakugo to Shuri. They made their move towards her, Bakugo trying to stop them. He used all that he had stored inside of the grenade gauntlets attached to the suit firing off a massive shot at the leader's back. He was easily able to tank the attack, destroying the wrist gauntlet, damaging Bakugo severely. Okoye would still try to fend off the other warriors. Shuri was grabbed by the back of her hair, swiftly hit in the neck and knocked out, as the creatures would disappear into the waters below. Okoye desperately tried to swim after them, but by the time she got into the waters, they were already gone. T'Challa was trying to regroup with everyone else, but that blast took him out of it. By the time he came to and learned about what had happened, it was safe to say that this was more than a failure. It was a loss of epic proportion. Where is Shuri? T'Challa would ask. They took her. They? What do you mean they? Some blue-skinned bastards. What am I supposed to say? What do you... Oh, God. Oh, God. What am I... T'Challa, come... Don't tell me to calm down. They took my sister. I don't know... I, I, I don't know what to do. I mean... They, I've got to do something. I've got to try to find her. I've got... To, I, I, I can't... I... Damn it! Everett was trying to get everything under control, but it was easier said than done. 
a Wakandan princess had been kidnapped by an unknown entity. Who knows what nation or what group they held allegiance to. Claw had gotten away. And what was worse, T'Challa found himself dejected with absolutely nothing. It was only a few days later, T'Challa and Okoye are desperately using any resource at their expense to try and get to where Shuri was. The tracker indicated that she was far off the coast into open ocean, but there were no islands in the area. This is her location, but there's no landmass from where I'm picking up. Okoye would say, it's under the water. How is that even possible? Under the water? T'Challa didn't have time to think of a plan because immediately he would get a call from his mom. There was someone here, someone who had brought something to Wakanda that required his immediate attention. T'Challa wasn't sure of what to do. He had to go back to Wakanda. But Shuri, he couldn't just leave his sister. Leave it to us, Everett would say. No, I'm not. I know someone, someone who can help. You're going to call her, Okoye would ask. You haven't spoken to her in three years. How do you know that she's going to drop? I know she'll help me. Listen, Bakugo, me and Okoye must go back to Wakanda. I need you to go and retrieve someone and help bring my sister back. Her name is Ramonda. T'Challa would take off a necklace he had been wearing. Show this to her. Tell her what happened. As long as you show her this, I know that she will help. Please, as soon as I've taken care of the business at home, I'll come back and help you guys out. But please do what you can. Yeah, sure thing. T'Challa and Okoye with heavy hearts would head back to Wakanda while Bakugo was left to deal with this. Everett, however, wasn't willing to let things just go down like that. He was already preparing to make calls when Bakugo would blow the phone in his hand. Kid, I don't know how stupid you are or you're not calling this in. What? I mean... You saw what happened. You're in no condition to fight this on your own. I'll handle it. Handle it? Kid, I don't think you comprehend the situation here, but this is far beyond little hero work. Washington, the UN might have to get involved in this. And by the time they do that, what? Have to go through a bunch of legislation and bullshit? I'm going to have to go back home. I'll probably be deported. And by the time you do do anything, Shuri will already be dead. Or who knows worse. I don't know what's worse than being dead. You know what I mean. Torin was being checked on in the hospital. James blamed himself for what had happened. He wanted revenge. Hearing what Bakugo was up to, he immediately tracked him down, finding him at the hangar as he was preparing to hop into his jet, ready to take off. And just where do you think you're going? This has nothing to do with you stars and stripes. Get lost. No way. You come to my country starting all of this, and now you're just going to leave? You know where I'm from? You're supposed to take responsibility for your actions. Bakugo would simply flip him off. 
However, before the door to the hatch would close, James would throw one of his energy projection shields, hopping inside as they started to take a lift off. Bakugo was about to knock him out of the hall, but the two of them fighting just long enough for the ship to be airborne as they were making their way to the coordinates he had been given to find this Romunda girl. Great, now I have to deal with a damn stowaway. <sighs> this cannot get any worse. Look, my friend got hurt. I don't know, but whoever's involved with this, they're going to pay. I can't let them get away. You're trying to do right by your friend? I understand that. But let me make this perfectly clear to you. You chose to get involved in this. Anything happens to you, it's on you. I'm not wasting my time or my efforts on a stowaway. You act like I need your help. You're the one that's on my ship. So why don't you look in the mirror? Bakugo decided to go take a seat. The armor was being worked on thanks to the armory that was on board, Jarvis making the necessary repairs. It was going to take a while. In the meantime, T'Challa had arrived back to Wakanda. Of course, his mother was definitely worried when she didn't see Shuri with him. T'Challa promised that he would explain everything, but for now, they had to deal with another matter. The young man that had arrived brought with him a body. The body of Ulysses Claw. His name was Eric Killmonger. And as they would come to learn, family. Killmonger did not waste any time or mince any words. He explained himself. He was the son of the former king's brother. The king's brother that he himself killed and left in cold blood. The reason why he was here was simple. He had a right to challenge for the throne. And he decided that he was going to take that opportunity right now. Of course, against better judgment, T'Challa accepted the fight. The sooner he could get done with this guy, the sooner he could make his way to Bakugo and the others to save his sister. Only it wasn't going to be that simple. Eric Killmonger. An orphan child, a child thought to be forgotten, taken in by the government, raised and trained to be a cold-blooded killer. Despite not even having a quirk, yes, for a quirkless individual, Killmonger had racked up many bodies in his day, from those that had quirks and those that didn't. What Killmonger had come to learn is that the quirk didn't make the man. It was the man that made the quirk. And for a man without a quirk, he had to make himself something even more. The training, the drive. He had to become something unstoppable, something unkillable. Something that couldn't be matched in any way, shape, and form. So, when the two of them were stripped of their quirks and they went toe-to-toe, -to -toe, Killmonger had his sights set. All of this death, all of this planning, everything he had done, just for this one moment. You see, when you travel around the world, you meet a lot of people. You make a lot of friends, a lot of enemies. But every now and again, you manage to meet that one person that's invaluable to you. 
a Killmonger, he met such a person three years ago. It was when he was on a mission. It was to guard an oil rig. Although, that's only what they would have the public believe. The oil rig was actually a front. They were drilling for something, but it damn sure wasn't oil. They were looking for vibranium. So, you can imagine his surprise when blue-skinned individuals come from under the water, attacking the rig itself and killing everyone on board. And leading the charge, something out of myth itself. A man with wings on his feet, flying and zipping in the air, stabbing his triton through every which way possible. When the head scientist who was in charge of the operation was locked up in his cabin with Killmonger guarding it, he came face to face with such an individual. You wish to stand in my way? I mean, it's a part of the job. You understand duty and all that. A man of valor. You will die braver but foolish than most. What's the big deal? This is just a regular old oil rig. You and I both know that's not the case. Yeah, you're right about that. I don't know what they're drilling around here. They don't tell me nothing. They are looking for vibranium. Hold on, what? You didn't know. Your people have been using this rig to try to drill for vibranium. And they've been getting very close to my territory. I can't allow that to stand. Hey yo, old head. Killmonger would ask the scientist hiding on the ground. Is this true? Yes. It's believed that there's a deposit of vibranium here. In this location. We haven't harmed anyone. Please. You don't have to do this. Is that so? Killmonger turned his pistol to the scientist shooting him dead. You kill your own? He ain't my own. I'm just a hired gun, and I go to the highest bidder. But I think you and I could do business together. Is that so? What if I told you there was a country, continent of Africa? They have a big deposit of vibranium. I'm guessing similar to wherever you live at under the sea. If such a place exists, then I would definitely know about it. Well, you're both pretty good at being hidden nations, so it's pretty easy to understand why neither one of you would know about each other. But trust me, it exists all right. And why do you tell me this? Because I'm trying to get there, but... It's a lot harder than you might think. But maybe we can help each other. You know, combine forces. I mean, I haven't heard about people like you before. It's obvious you're quirk users. Water-based, probably. If I had to take a guess, your people probably developed quirks during an earlier period in time. A time when you wouldn't be accepted. You've kept yourself hidden under the waters ever since. And now, as society continues to grow and advance, it threatens your way of life, your people. I know the feeling. If you help me, help me ascend to the throne of Wakanda, then maybe I can help you out. And once I'm in charge, we join together No one's going to be able to stop us. (laughs) This world is filled with powerful individuals. You speak like it will be that easy.
Because it is. Trust. You hang around people long enough, you get to know them real well. We have a deal? You are an intriguing one. Who are you? Some call me Eric. Others, Killmonger. And you? King Namor. Nice to make your acquaintance. Killmonger. The culmination of their plan finally bore fruit. T'Challa lied defeated, thrown off of the cliffside into the waters below, as Killmonger now ascended to the throne of Wakanda. Wakanda's top princess in the clutches of the king of the rival nation the two forces that would join together with the world being in the palm of their hands. For Bakugo, what started as a simple helping hand had now escalated into something truly dire. Two nations hidden away in secrecy now under the leadership of those who wish to step out of the shadows and join together, they would show this world what true power looked like. This concludes My Hero Academia Armored Adventures, the movie Wakanda Forever, part one. As always, if you enjoyed today's video and everything else that we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings that has to come out now and in the future. Stay tuned for tomorrow as we will conclude with part two of My Hero Academia Armored Adventures, the movie Wakanda Forever. What if Deku was Iron Man? Part 2, the part 2 movie finale. But anyway, that's going to do it for the end of today's video. I'm Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings. Signing off, and I'll see you next time.